Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be with all of you, uh, and wonderful to be back in Israel, and really a special honor to be here uh, giving the Patricia Memorial Lecture. Um, she's someone I was very fond of and a great fan of her work, and like all of you, I miss her quite a bit. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some work on sensitive periods in brain development. Um, much of this comes from uh, work that I've been doing over the last 15 years in a study in Romania that I've talked about uh, in the past at the Hebrew University, but I hope I will have a slightly different take and there are new findings and um, also to contextualize it to talk about a few other things. So the question of sensitive periods raises questions like what's the role of experiences in long-term adaptation, how much how reversible are early adverse experiences? Does the timing of interventions matter? And the question for clinicians, is it ever too late? Um, all these questions are um, getting increased attention in work in the US at least, in part because of a study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that you may have heard of. This is a study in San Diego of adults between the ages of, say, 25 and 85, and they're asked 10 questions. Um, when you were a child, did anyone in your family have a psychiatric problem, a substance abuse problem, ever go to jail? Um, were you ever physically abused, sexually abused, neglected, emotionally abused, et cetera? 10 questions, and you tally up the responses. Um, so you get a number from 0 to 10. and Perhaps not surprisingly, um, the number of adverse experiences is predictive of um, problems like depression and substance abuse and alcohol abuse and suicide attempts. But perhaps more surprisingly, it's also related to cardiovascular disease, to pulmonary disease, to liver disease, to a whole variety of health conditions that you wouldn't necessarily associate with early adverse experiences. So now there's a great deal of excitement in trying to understand the mechanisms by which adverse experiences affect uh, not only mental health but also physical health. So in thinking about brain development, um, this is sort of a way that I've found useful to think about it, that the basic blueprint of brain development and the basic architecture of the brain is spelled out pretty carefully by genetics. And when there are problems with that, then we get major brain anomalies, many of them incompatible with life. But the basic architecture is sort of laid out pretty clearly. But then a substantial amount of brain development, particularly the way that circuits wire together, seems to be responsive to experience. And there are two ways that experience may impact the developing brain, experience expectant development and experience dependent. Experience expectant means the experiences that members of a species are expected to have in typical rearing conditions. And in experience expectant development is the concept of sensitive periods, that at certain points in development, experience is particularly influential. And if it occurs before that sensitive period opens or after that sensitive period closes, it doesn't have nearly as powerful an effect as if it occurs during that open window. Experience-dependent development means that the individual experiences of that particular child or adult impacts their brain development. So for example, it appears that human beings are wired to develop verbal language. That's an experience-expectant phenomenon, but the particular language that they speak is experience-dependent. Similarly, uh, young children are wired to form attachments to caregivers. And in any kind of reasonable caregiving condition, they will form attachments. But the nature of that attachment, the quality of that attachment relationship, depends on the particular individual experiences that that child has with that caregiver. So when we talk about sensitive periods, we're talking about limited time during which the effects of experience are especially strong. And what this means is that experience uh, instructs the neural circuits, informs the neural circuits, provides input to the neural circuits so that they can process the information adequately 
and provide information that's essential for normal development. So some of this work goes back to Conrad Lorenz, who you remember studied geese and goslings. And what he found was that geese brains are primed so that the first thing that they encounter that moves, they imprint to and follow. And in this case, Conrad Lorenz himself was the first person these little goslings followed. And so they're imprinted to him, and they follow him all around. Then came the work of Hubel and Weasel. These are kind of the classic studies on sensitive periods in which they studied first kittens and then monkeys and showed that if you restrict um, input to one eye during a critical period in development, that vision never develops properly in that eye. And there are permanent changes, permanent alterations in the structure in the occipital cortex responsible for vision. Some of my favorite work uh, in this area is by a guy at Stanford, Eric Knudsen, who's a neurobiologist who studies owls. So it turns out that owls have an exquisite map in their head that connects their visual system and their auditory system so that when they're flying above the ground at about 30 feet, they can see and hear the mouse and pounce just at the right point to get their dinner. So what Eric Knudsen does is he puts these little goggles on the owls that shifts their visual fields about 10 or 15 degrees. So now when they fly along and they see the mouse and they pounce, they miss. So they have to learn how to adjust the map between their auditory input and their visual input so that they can get the mouse and survive. And in fact, they do that. And he shows that juvenile owls do this more quickly than adult owls, et cetera. Then he takes the goggles off, and now they have to readjust and go back to learn how to get the mouse without the 10 or 15 degree visual field adjustment. So what he's shown is that, first of all, the owl develops new circuitry when he puts the goggles on them. And when he takes the goggles off, the old circuitry is still there, and they can go back and use the old circuitry again. So, uh, and there are periods at which it becomes too late for the owls to adjust their vision. So there is this kind of sensitive period that is involved. OK, so we've talked about several species. What about people? So it turns out, if we want to do an ideal study to assess the effects of timing, we first of all would do comprehensive assessments of infants who've experienced some kind of uniform early adversity. So their adverse experience is very similar. And then we randomly assign them to interventions that vary systematically at the age at which they get taken out of adversity and put into adequate caregiving. And then follow them longitudinally into adulthood. Well, for obvious reasons, that study can't be done uh, in people. But it has been done, it turns out, in rhesus macaques. So this is the work uh, of Judy Cameron and her colleagues. And she has uh, monkeys in a primate center um, who are cage-reared. So they live in social groups of about eight monkeys in a group. And she was aware of some of the early work of infant mothers being separated from adult, uh, from their mothers uh, who were adults. And um, what she noticed was that the infants were removed from the mothers in many of these studies, which confounds the separation with removal from the social group and being put in a novel environment and all those kind of things. So she was looking for a model of depression and what she did is she removed the mother from the social group rather than the infant. Now, these are carefully studied monkeys. There are a whole bunch of assessments that are done routinely, um, a test of exploration and inhibition, approach to novel objects, approach to strangers, and monkeys have a hard time with humans who are approaching them, to novel rewarding stimuli. And because they know these monkeys well and they've studied them over generations, they know what the heritability of all their response. So knowing who this baby monkey is, they can predict 
incredibly accurately how the monkey is going to perform in this particular test. So just keep that in mind that these are extremely highly heritable behaviors. So ordinarily, in these group settings, infant monkeys are removed from their mothers at six months of age and then become part of a new social group. So that's the typical experience. So what she did is she removed mothers at three months, at one month, and at one week to look at what is the differential effect of removal of the mother at those different ages. So it turns out the three-month separated monkeys behave very much like the six-month separated monkeys. There are a few subtle differences on a few uh, behaviors, but overall really pretty minor effects. The one-month separated, however, have very large effects. The one-month separated <clears throat> become immediately withdrawn, unresponsive. Some of them had to be force-fed to be kept alive, and then after they recovered from that acute period of withdrawal, they became clingy to other monkeys long past the age at which clinging on to other monkeys is considered okay in rhesus monkey world. So they would cling on well into adulthood, cling on to other monkeys. The one week separated had no immediate response to the removal, however, they had the most abnormal social behaviors at all. Never really engaged socially with other monkeys, remained on the periphery, just sort of observed what was going on, and had intense reactions to efforts of other monkeys to engage with them socially. So very profound differences depending upon the age at which this uh, adverse experience occurred to these monkeys. So the next question is, well, how remediable is this? So they looked at the one week separated monkeys and they got <coughs> a super mother monkey, um, a foster mother, if you will, who's a very skilled mother. And they paired up the one week separated monkeys with this super, super mom monkey. And what they found was that if it was early enough, the monkey would recover and have more or less normal social behavior. But after a period of about seven days, after the original mother is removed and then seven days later, if you introduce the super mom, that was too late and the monkey didn't respond to the super mom's uh, efforts to care for him or her at all. So there's this very narrow window of only about a week in which it was possible to remediate. So, the timing of adverse early experience plays a critical role in determining both brain and behavioral function. I didn't mention that they have studied the brains of some of these monkeys and there are major differences in gene expression in the amygdala in both the one week different from the th uh, one month different from the three month and dendritic branching in the cortex. Um, so, major changes in brain structure related to the timing of this adverse experience that these monkeys endured. Okay, so turning to humans, um, this is the closest thing we have to uh, assessing uh, the effects of timing and removal. And since the fall of the Ceausescu regime and the discovery of almost 200,000 children living in large and personal institutions in Romania, there have been a number of studies that have assessed these kids and several longitudinal studies. One of the most important is a study from the UK called the English and Romanian Adoptee Study that you may be familiar with, conducted by Michael Rutter and his colleagues. And they have described four what they call deprivation-specific patterns of behavior that represent abnormalities following the experience of early deprivation in the form of institutional rearing. Um, one is quasi-autism, a syndrome in which the children look in preschool years very similar, in fact clinically indistinguishable from children with classical autism. Later appear not classically autistic but still quite uh, unusual and quite odd in their social behaviors. A uh, group of kids with serious cognitive impairment um, that's prolonged. A uh, group of kids with inattention overactivity, and in fact, 
um, what we call ADHD or inattention overactivity is one of the most common forms of social abnormalities that persists even after children are put into adequate caregiving environments and what they call disinhibited attachment or disinhibited social behavior. So what this slide shows, all you have to do is compare these tall bars with the little short bars, and you can see these are both zero. Here's one kid and two kids. What this displays is kids who were adopted before and after six months. The kids adopted before six months are the ones in dark blue down here, and the kids adopted after six months. So essentially, almost all of the children who exhibit one or more of these deprivation-specific patterns were adopted after the age of six months, suggesting that the window of recovery for children adopted before six months is quite good, but after that becomes more problematic. Um, there are a number of reasons why um, institutional rearing is associated with deprivation. Um, typically, and there, there's a lot of variability from one institution to another and even within the same institution and even within the same unit in the same institution from child to child, but nevertheless, there are these modal features. Very regimented daily schedules, many have high child to caregiver ratios, non-individualized care, lack of psych psychological investment by caregivers, and rotating shifts. So essentially, inadequate care and oftentimes insensitive care. And not surprisingly, if you look at the literature on children who have histories of institutional rearing, you find increases in a whole variety of psychological, social, and cognitive um, problems that these children have. Now, obviously, children who get placed in institutions, um, particularly those placed at birth, um, often come with a whole variety of risk factors that um, are independent or at least um, precede institutional rearing. They have limited prenatal care. They may have exposure to toxins prenatally, a whole variety of, of problems. Um, but we believe that many of the problems that children who are raised in institutions exhibit are the result of the institutional experience because if you look at the international adoption literature, in fact, a substantial number of these children will make complete or at least substantial recoveries from their early uh, problems. So there seems to be a capacity for recovery in children who get into more normative environments. So <clears throat> we had an opportunity to conduct a study in Romania. We were invited uh, by the Minister for Child Protection who was interested in developing alternatives to institutional care, but who was um, getting a lot of resistance um, because um, once this institutional approach to caring for abandoned children was established, um, lots of people became invested in sustaining it um, because government agencies would get budgets based on it, villages would get a budget for the institution that provided employment for people who lived there, and so there was a lot of resistance. Um, and he was interested in saying, you know, is foster care an alternative? And so that's how we got into collaborating about this. This is uh, St. Catherine's Placement Center, um, which at the time of the Ceausescu overthrow uh, was the largest institution for young children in Romania. There were 850 children less than three years old uh, in this institution. So it's many buildings around this kind of campus. And over the course of the week, the children were involved with large numbers of caregiving adults, but had limited opportunities to form meaningful relationships with any of them because of the nature of um, the way the system was structured. Um, you'll be interested to know that uh, there are now zero children in this institution, and the number of children in Romanian institutions has dropped from about 170,000, is the U.S. Embassy estimate at its peak, to now fewer than 20,000. And those 20,000 are mostly severely handicapped children. And instead of being in these large impersonal institutions, they're now in small group home settings um, with adequate staffing ratios. So it's really a far different picture uh, than it was. There are many, many problems that remain in the child protection system there, but it's far better than it was. 
In any case, we began this work in 2000 with some piloting and then launched our formal intervention in 2001. And what we did was conduct a randomized control trial of foster care as an alternative to institutional care for children who'd been abandoned and placed in institutions. So there were six institutions for young children at that time in Romania. And the typical thing that happened was children would be abandoned at birth, the mother would check out of the hospital, leave the child in the hospital, the child would remain for a few months in the hospital, then be transferred over to one of these baby institutions, um, and usually put on a quarantine unit there for a month or two, and then transferred to another unit, and then subsequent transfers might occur, and I could never figure out what the reason for all of those subsequent transfers were, um, sometimes trying to balance out staffing ratios and that kind of thing. Anyway, so we identified 136 children who, we started with 187, and we screened out children who had obvious genetic uh, syndromes um, or obvious signs of fetal alcohol syndrome. They were between six and 31 months of age. We comprehensively assessed them and then randomized them to care as usual uh, or to foster care which we created, because at that time, foster care was extremely limited in Bucharest. There were two government-sponsored foster homes, I think, um, uh, and so we created a foster care network and provided that as an alternative. Um, part of the uh, negotiations for the study was that we would not interfere in any way with placement of the children. The child protection authorities made all the decisions about where the children went. And over the course of time, many children were returned to their biological parents or adopted or placed in government-sponsored foster care that didn't exist at the time the study began, and we had no uh, role in that. Um, the other part of the negotiation was that the Romanian government agreed to assume uh, responsibility for managing the foster care network at the completion of the study, which is when the children were 54 months of age. So we turned the system over to the government and they assumed uh, control of that. So uh, the foster care intervention, we recruited three social workers um, who uh, had very limited experience but were extraordinarily bright young women. And we trained them, and then we provided weekly consultation to them by phone and video throughout the entire study. And they provided very substantial amounts of support to the foster parents that they were responsible for with frequent phone calls, in-person visits, problem solving when problems arose, uh, help with referrals, and those sorts of things. The foster care training that they received was actually an adaptation of foster training in the U.S. that had been developed by one of the NGOs um, by Romanians for Romanians, and that's what we used uh, in the initial training. Basically, we encouraged these foster parents to love the children as if they were their own, to make a long-term commitment to the children, um, to plan on the children being with them until they uh, reach the age of maturity. Through the uh, uh, completion of the randomized control trial, which was when the children were 54 months of age. We had 87% placement stability. One foster mother died. One had to be hospitalized psychiatrically for serious problems, and a couple of others um, just felt that they couldn't do it anymore. And we have objective uh, ratings that the quality of care that the children received in the foster homes was, in fact, better than the quality of care that they received in institutions. At the completion of the trial, across a very large range of developmental domains, we showed that the children who had been placed in foster care after initially being raised in institutions um, fared better than children who did not. As I mentioned, over the course of the study, um, <clears throat> many things changed. So if we look at the kids at the 12-year follow-up, we did follow-up at age 8, age 12, and we're currently conducting a follow-up at age 16. 29 are in their original foster homes. Five have been institutionalized for serious behavior problems and been put in what is essentially residential care. Eight are in government foster homes. Two have been adopted. 12 have been reintegrated with their biological families, and another 12 have dropped out of the study. Most of those are kids who are adopted. All the adoptions, by the way, are domestic adoptions within Romania. Um, and then the care as usual group, you can see there are 20 kids who are in institutions. Actually, at age eight, 
There were only about eight children in institutions. It's gone up no more because as the children have gotten older and their behavior problems have gotten more severe, some of the families are saying they can't care for the kids anymore. So by age 12, you can say that this intervention that the children received at an average age of 22 months, but at no older than 31 months, is an assessment of uh, early intervention. And in fact, across a whole range of outcomes, we're showing intervention effects. So externalizing signs in boys are significantly lower in the foster care group. Callous unemotional traits or early indicators of psychopathy are reduced in boys at age 12. This is reactive attachment disorder, and you can see that the care as usual group remains elevated, whereas the foster care group is down here indistinguishable from the community kids. Um, so powerful intervention effects regarding psychopathology and also other things. This is attention bias, and although there are no differences in attention bias to threat, there are significant differences in attention bias, attention bias to positive in the foster care group compared to the care as usual group. This is looking at reward learning, and the foster care group here is indistinguishable from the community kids in terms of their motivation and response to rewards, whereas the care as usual group lags behind. So at uh, age 12, there are all these outcomes that suggest that this early change in experience led to changes in their developmental trajectories. Most recently, we have been looking at uh, an assessment of competence, and we've looked at the following areas, academic competence, family relations, peer relations, impaired functioning from psychopathology, substance use, risk-taking behaviors, and physical health. And essentially what we did is we had these community kids, which I don't think I mentioned, but we have a group of community kids recruited from pediatric clinics and schools in Bucharest who are typically developing Romanian children with no history of uh, institutional rearing. And we have those kids because we need a Romanian reference because we're using all these measures that have never been used in Romania before and, and we want to be able to compare to typically developing Romanians. So what we did across all of these domains is we looked at the kids who fell within one standard deviation of the community kids. And if they were within one standard deviation of the community kids, then we deemed them competent for that particular domain. And here you see the domains, and the dark bar is the foster care kids, and the lighter blue is the care as usual kids. And the only significant differences were in academic competence and peer relations, where the foster care kids were significantly uh, different as a group compared to the care as usual kids. However, we defined overall competence as being competent in five of the seven domains. And when you do that, you find that just over half of the foster care kids are deemed competent, whereas fewer than a quarter of the care as usual kids are deemed competent across five out of seven of the uh, domains. And we also found timing effects for competence, which I'll mention later. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about within the foster care group who went from institutional care into foster placement did the timing matter? Because you remember that the kids range from six months of age at the youngest up to 31 months of age at the oldest. And so we're, we'll be looking at um, were there differences in timing. So in these groups, inside playtime, outside playtime, as you just look around, you see a large number of kids engaging in these kind of stereotypic behaviors. <clears throat> and we assess those. And here you're looking at kids who were placed, this, this is at 30 months of age, so our first follow-up. Kids who were placed into foster care at less than a year of age, kids who were placed between one and two years, and kids who were placed after two years. Then again, at 42 months, kids placed less than a year, kids placed between one and two years, and kids placed after two years. So the earlier the child was placed, the more uh, the fewer stereotypies one was likely to see. And if you look, when we completed the trial, there were no kids placed less than a year who had any stereotypies, one to two years, and greater than two years. Looked at cognition, and we assessed it at baseline, 42 months using the Bailey scales, at 54 months using the WIPSI, 8 and 12 years using the WISC. So 
Here we're looking at 30, 42, and 54 months, and you see the care as usual kids compared to the foster care kids. But it turns out this difference is completely explained by the kids who were placed prior to 24 months. The kids placed after 24 months were not different in terms of their IQ scores to the kids who were in the care as usual group. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, kids placed before 18 months of age had uh, uh, IQ scores uh, up in the mid-90s, between 18 and 24 months in the high 80s, 24 to 30 months, and after 30 months down here in the high 70s. So depending on the age at which the child was placed, we saw these um, powerful effects on IQ. Similar story for language. Here we're looking at Z-score uh, on the Raynell, which is a test of expressive and receptive language. And here expressive is in gray and receptive is in blue, but you see they're very, very similar. This is the care as usual group. And these lines, which I think you can see, are standard deviations below the mean on this measure. So what it says is the kids who were placed into foster care before 15 months of age were indistinguishable from the norms on the test, whereas the kids placed after 29 months of age, or here after 24 months of age, essentially are indistinguishable from the care as usual kids, and either at or almost at three standard deviations below the mean for language development at 42 months of age. Um, <clears throat> we also looked at mean length of utterance at 42 months of age and words, and essentially what you see is the kids who were placed before 24 months of age are indistinguishable from the community kids, whereas the kids placed after 24 months of age are indistinguishable from the care as usual kids or institutional group. Next, we'll look at brain activity, which we assessed with EEGs, and we looked at a number of different frequencies, the beta frequency, the alpha frequency, theta. Um, alpha and beta, what we found at baseline was that the um, children who were uh, living in institutions compared to the community kids had significantly lower alpha and beta uh, activity compared to the community kids and significantly greater theta activity, which is compatible with a kind of developmental delay. But this is at age eight. Um, uh, and here we're looking at alpha power, but it's very similar slide for beta power. Here we have the care as usual group here, and here blue and green represent less activity, and red and yellow represent more electrical activity. So we're just looking at the amount of alpha activity in the brain. These are the kids placed into foster care after 24 months of age, and you can see that they're visually and statistically indistinguishable from the care as usual group, whereas the kids placed in foster care before 24 months of age Anyway, statistically and visually indistinguishable here. So very powerful effects on brain functioning. This is at age eight, so this is four years after the intervention was concluded. The kids were turned over, and many of these kids, remember, many of the kids uh, in this group are in families at this point. At age eight, there were only eight kids who were still living in institutions, so the vast, vast majority of these kids are now in families. So this is really based on this early alteration in caregiving setting leading to uh, differences many years later. Attachment, <clears throat> and what we found was that the foster care group was significantly more likely to form both secure and organized attachments. And here we're looking at security of attachment and the age at which the child was placed. And you see that the majority of the kids who were placed prior to 24 months, this is between seven and 18 months, and this is 18 to 24 months, form secure attachments to their caregivers, whereas the kids placed after 24 months are significantly less likely. Importantly, these kids still, some of these kids still form secure attachments, so it's not impossible, but it's significantly less likely that that will occur. So, what these kids do is they violate boundaries, and although we allow young children to violate these kinds of boundaries more than we do older people, even here you see this kind of unconscious discomfort with this child, the intensity of this child's closeness who she's, after all, never seen before. 
So this is something that's been another uh, problem that's been described in kids with histories of institutional rearing. And basically what we showed is that the kids who were placed prior to 24 months had significant reductions compared to the kids placed after 24 months. And by the way, even at age 12, we're getting intervention effects on reductions of indiscriminate behavior, which I'm pretty stunned by. But um, significant reductions in the foster care kids compared to the care as usual kids. Here we're looking at teacher ratings of social skills when the kids are eight years old. And here we're looking at the break point seems to be at around 20 months, care as usual kids, foster care kids placed after 20 months of age, indistinguishable. Kids placed before 24 months of age, indistinguishable from the community kids. So higher levels of social skills based on age of placement again. Looked at stress response, and um, I'll explain the paradigm here. This is at age 12. We have a peer evaluation task that I'll tell you about, the TRIER social stress test, and I'll show you what we did for that, a frustration task, uh, and then a, actually a reward task is the recovery period. So <clears throat> we ask each child, what's your favorite sport? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite kind of music or band or singer? And then they get pictures of 30 Romanian children. And each picture has the child's favorite sport, favorite food, and favorite kind of music band, et cetera. And they pick the 10 kids they'd most like to meet and play with based on this information that they get. And so on the green board, they place the 10 kids that they'd like to play with, and then there are the 20 kids that they uh, prefer not to play with. And they come back in a subsequent visit, and in the subsequent visit, they find out none of the kids that they picked wanted to play with them. So that's the stressor. Um, that's the peer evaluation test. Then, to make matters worse, they have to prepare a speech and give the speech in front of judges. And the judges are people that we've recruited. They're told that they're teachers. But in fact, it was a nurse and a graduate student. And they are instructed to maintain these very uh, neutral or even somewhat disapproving uh, uh, stares during the speech. And then they're given a math problem. And they um, get uh, the math problem. Uh, they get a indication when they get the problem right, but some of the feedback that they get is incorrect. So it's, again, a kind of uh, another uh, stressor. Then they have a computer screen where they're uh, uh, supposed to push a number uh, on, on the keyboard that matches the number on the computer screen. They're flashed up very quickly. When they get it correct, they get a ding and a smiley face. When they get it incorrect, they get a frowny face that's red. And what happens after they practice and get trained up is 70% of the time they get accurate feedback and 30% of the time they get inaccurate feedback. So they, they're told that they're inaccurate even when they were accurate. Anyway, so then we look at cortisol samples taken at baseline during the peer stressor, uh, during the Trier test, during the frustration, and then during recovery. And what you can see here, what this looks like is that the community kids may mount a nice stress response, whereas the care as usual kids are flat, and the foster care kids are mounting something kind of in between. But it turns out if you split the foster care kids into those who were placed before 24 months, they look exactly like the community kids did. They mount a nice, healthy stress response with their cortisol, whereas the kids placed prior, uh, after 24 months, sorry, have a flattened response much like the care as usual kids do. We also looked at autonomic nervous system responses to stressors, and here we're looking at respiratory sinus arrhythmia as a parasympathetic measure and pre-ejection period as a sympathetic reactivity measure. And here we're looking at change in respiratory sinus arrhythmia or vagal withdrawal. And here you see the community kids, the foster care kids, and the care as usual kids. Here the community kids are significantly different from the care as usual kids and the foster care kids aren't different from either. But if you divide the foster um, kids into those placed less than 18 months and after 18 months, there's significant differences in their uh, change in respiratory sinus arrhythmia. 
So depending on which variable you look at, there are timing effects across all these domains, only some of which I've talked about. Um, but different ages at which there seems to be a break and a significant difference between those placed before and after these ages. So the most important thing that I'm going to say is don't leave with a particular number in your head of at this point uh, it's a problem because these numbers, as you saw from the Rudder study where their number is six months, our numbers are all different than that because we didn't have any kids under six months of age to look at. So if you look at our findings and the Rudder findings and the findings of all the similar studies that have been conducted around the world, the reasonable conclusion is that the earlier children get out of adversity and into a better environment, the better they do. Beyond that, to say this is the age or this is the age or this is the age is just not compatible with the findings to date. The problem is that this what these findings suggest to me is that we need to have a certain urgency about responding to children who are living in adversity. And in the United States, there are understandable efforts to try to work with children who are living in adversity, for instance, who've been maltreated, keep them in their homes, provide support to them. Um, foster care is considered a pretty crummy intervention in the United States. Um, and not without some reason. Um, but uh, what these data suggest are that, um, in fact, if you look at the data on what's called family preservation, I don't know what it's called in, in Israel, if you have anything comparable to that, but we call those family preservation efforts. The data are pretty grim. Uh, not only do the kids look worse than kids who are in foster care, they, most of the kids wind up in foster care ultimately anyway, but they wind up in foster care after more prolonged exposure to very serious adversity. So we have a real uh, quandary about wanting to be, wanting to recognize the importance uh, and be respectful of family boundaries on the one hand, but on the other hand, being concerned that if we don't respond and don't respond when children are very young, then um, serious problems may result for those kids. So in terms of answering these questions, I think it somewhat depends on if you're answering it from a clinical perspective or from a research perspective or from a policy perspective. So if I'm answering from a clinical perspective, um, clinicians by nature are willing to take risks. They're pragmatic. They're optimistic. They just want something that works, and they're going to try and try and try to do whatever it works. So from a clinical perspective, it's never too late. Researchers, on the other hand, are cautious and skeptical and even sometimes grumpy, and they don't believe anything, and there always needs to be more evidence, and I'm not sure that's right, and what about this, and what about that, and what. So if we wait for the researchers to be happy, we'll never get anything done, because they'll never be happy. But we can't invest willy-nilly in every little clinical thing that comes along, and somebody says, well, I know what to do about this, but they're, you know, because I did this with a kid and it worked. So the policy people have to be sort of balanced about this, and they have to weigh the evidence, and they have to say, OK, now I think there's sufficient evidence that I'm going to invest in this and try to do something about this. And what's happened in the United States in the last decade, I would say, is that there's been an increasing consensus about the importance and even the economic value of intervening as quickly as possible, as soon as possible. And, uh, but we have to be careful because just intervening any old way isn't necessarily going to produce the results we want. We have to intervene in ways that we believe have been at least have some evidence demonstrating that they're effective or that we're going to evaluate them for their effectiveness. So uh, this is our team. I want to particularly highlight Chuck Nelson and Nathan Fox because the three of us have kind of run this study from the beginning. But this is our wonderful Bucharest team. This is Elizabeth Furtado from North Carolina, who's our project manager. And the rest of these folks are all of our Romanian collaborators. Anka Radulescu was the very first research assistant that we hired. And she's been with us from the beginning. And we're delighted to still have her. So. Uh, on that note, I will say thanks. I appreciate it very much. And am I doing questions now, or are we going to do that later?
Okay. So I'm happy to take uh, questions or comments. The foster families here in Israel have very different um, amounts and, and levels of intervention. And uh, those, so those that, if I understood right, those that you studied were, had accompaniment during many years. I mean, they were on an intervention program and were followed. Um, so they had a good, they, I, meant, I mean to say that they were well cared for. The foster families. The foster families. Yes. And, um, and the results may have been different. I mean, the difference between the two groups may have been smaller if the foster families wouldn't have been so well uh, uh, cared for. And we, so I think that an, an additional point that comes out of this research is the need to have very um, um, well-monitored uh, interventions for foster care families, which is not the case in most of well, what I know here in Israel. Uh, foster families have to, they are, they, they, they are some kind of, there is some kind of a follow-up, but it's a, it's, a, it's a loose one. It's not a real intervention. So, because um, we have to, I think we have to be careful. Foster care families doesn't, is not automatically a much, much better solution than sometimes a good small group home. Yeah, so I, thank you, Mary. I was with you until your last statement, which I disagree with. Um, so you're absolutely right. In the United States, they are poorly supported as well. So my conclusion from that is we should provide better support. Not that we shouldn't put kids in foster care, but that we should provide better support. I mean, so we, the way we set this up was we had clinicians in New Orleans who were very experienced in working with children who'd been maltreated providing support to social workers, who then provided support to foster families, who then provided support to the children in their care. So we had these kind of concentric circles of support set up. In the US, foster care sometimes works extraordinarily well, but generally by accident. Uh, not because we intentionally try to, uh, I mean, foster care is an intervention. Society says, we're not gonna just leave these children to be maltreated, we're gonna intervene and do something about it. So this is our intervention, and just like all interventions, it can be done very well or it can be done very poorly. And as I said, when it goes well, it seems to go well because just that sort of worked out that way. There are some models of foster care in the United States that I'm very excited about. They need to be better evaluated, but there's something called the Quality Parenting Initiative in which foster parents are made a member of the team. And the team is the parents the child was removed from, the child protective services worker, and the foster parent. And they collaborate together in the best interest of the child. And the foster parent is given more responsibility, but is also treated more respectfully and uh, is more better responded to and all those kind of things. And it is unbelievable how in the state of Florida, they were in danger of going back to institutional care because they were losing foster parents year after year after year. They started this and they no longer have a shortage of foster parents because it attracts a different kind of person who says, I want to do this, I want to be engaged in this, this is a meaningful thing to do. And these people are paid just like uh, non-QPI, they're paid a subsidy to cover the child's expenses, which is a few hundred dollars a month, it's not very much, they're not paid salaries. That's the other thing is in Romania, these are salaried positions. It's based on the French model where foster parents are paid uh, by the state to, to do these jobs. So if you look at the literature, and it's not a big literature, it's a small literature, there are about a dozen studies. Every single study that has compared children in foster care to children in some kind of group care show the children in foster care look better. And Brenda Jones Harden, whom you know, did a little study in Washington in, based in the late 80s, early 90s. There was a big cocaine epidemic in a lot of US cities. And, and they started removing kids at birth who were cocaine exposed. 
and they overwhelmed the foster care system, and they had to create group care to care for the kids in some of these big metropolitan areas. So she looked at kids in one place where there were 50 kids down to about four kids in group care and compared them to kids in foster care. Now, and basically what she showed is that the, not only did the foster care kids look better, the more the group care looked like a foster home, the better the kids did. So the big places didn't look as good as the really small places. Um, now, the problem with all those other studies, other than the Bucharest study, is that you don't know what led some kids to go to group care and some kids to go to foster care. So um, there may well be a belief that this kid's got problems, so we're going to send them to group care. They're more handicapped in some particular way or another compared to these kids. But so, so that's the advantage of doing a randomized control trial is you control for that. Now, you know, the criticism uh, of this study is, well, that's Romania, and those were terrible institutions, and they're infamous, and, you know, there are much better institutions than Romanian institutions around the world, and I, I believe that that's true. So, I mean, that is a challenge, but at a policy level, if I'm one of those in-between people, if I'm going to invest in something, I'm going to invest in high-quality foster care rather than invest in group care, because I think there is something about the nature of group care that tends towards the impersonal, no matter how good we try to make it. So. Hi, I have a question about, uh, that maybe is related to the question of, is it too late or not? Yeah, yeah. Um, did you look at the, what we call the resilient children, the one that were, let's say, adopted after 24 months and where you saw there was a group, a small group of children, 20% that were secure. So did you specifically look at these children to say, to see why are these children secure? Why do they behave? Basically, why are they resilient? Why are, why are there secure attachments in the kids? I mean, you're not. In the care as usual group. Right. You, yeah. They, no, we have, I mean. Well, the not one, the care of usual, uh, as usual, the one that were adopted after, or were placed, placed after in foster 20, care after, after 24, 24 months. months. Yeah. No, we haven't done that. The, no. Um, we're in this latest analysis of competence, which we're still in the midst of, of actually doing. That's the closest we've gotten, because we have kids, especially if you look at our cognitive data, there seem to be a group of kids in the care as usual group who are very low at the beginning and just remain low over time. And there's another group of kids who show this kind of modest increase over time. And that's a group we'd like to understand better. Um, it may be, so we know, for example, if you look at, in, if you look at uh, uh, emotionally withdrawn reactive attachment disorder, what you see is that as soon as you place the kids in foster care, signs of that completely go away. In the care as usual group, between uh, 30 months of age and 12 years, there's a gradual downward slope. So as a group, the signs are diminishing. But if you remove the kids who are placed in families and just look at the kids who remain in institutions over time, it's a completely flat line. There's no improvement whatsoever. So one of the things that we've done, um, and I hope I live to be 200 to deal with these data, but we have every month of every child's life, we know where they were. So we've track that over time. So one of the things we've looked at a fair amount is just the percentage of time that you lived in an institution, and we can look at it between certain ages, like kids in the first five years or kids who in the first 12 years, whatever. Um, but we can begin to look at more sort of person-centered analysis, which is kind of what you're asking about. But um, it's a good idea. We just haven't done that yet. I was wondering two things. One, did you compare the foster care to adoption? Does it make a difference? Um, and the other thing is you told us not to leave here with an age, because I was really yes. you know, thinking of the six <laughs> months, the 24 months, I'm very, and I read a lot of studies about this, so I've, I've seen different findings. And I'm wondering if we can leave with the, I mean, I understand we have to leave with the fact that it has to be the earlier, the better. Right. But could it be that the, like the basic, the, like the, la the latest is 24 months? Can we say that from the findings? No, I Not won't even? let you say that, no. 
The reason is because some of those things have to do with this particular sample, and you'd want to have a huge range of ages and a very large sample tracked over a long period of time before you really did that. I mean, really, 25 months compared to 24? What about 26? What about 28? What about 30? What about this kid? I mean, it's just, I want you to leave with urgency about early rather than having a particular age in mind because I think it's just too tricky. So I'm going to start with that uh, question. The first question, the answer is no. Um, there are fewer than 20 kids overall who are adopted, and I suppose we could look at them. Some analysis, uh, analyses that we've done have been looking at kids in uh, the original foster placement, what we call MacArthur Foster Care, because our original funding was from the MacArthur Foundation, MacArthur Foster Care compared to everybody else, and they generally look better. We probably could look at an adopted group, both in care, you know, so for example, I didn't mention this, but in these analyses, whatever the original group assignment was, that's the group that the child is in when we do the analysis. And so we had a care as usual kid who was adopted a week after the baseline assessment, but that kid is always assessed in the care as usual group. So all these findings are conservative estimates of what the actual might be. We've done some analysis where we've broken intent to treat, and for example, with regard to psychopathology, we've shown that kids who had more stable placements across the first 12 years do better than kids who had less stable placements. So we've, got, we've gotten more data lately in, in that competent, uh, competence analysis. The number of disruptions reduces the likelihood that the child's going to be competent. Now you can say, well, of course, because kids who have serious problems are going to be more likely to disrupt than kids who don't. But when we go back to 54 months and younger, there are absolutely no differences in the kids who later disrupt and the kids who don't. So it looks to us like it's whether the caregiving environment got disrupted rather than that the child had problems which led to the disruption. We can't prove it, but, but that's what the data seem most compatible with. So thank you all very much. <laughs>